how many pager duty, I'll oh, stand near the mics, how many pager duty customers do we have, or pay guys on pager duty have we got in the room today? This is quite a few of you, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, how many of you guys have actually been through our incident commander training or seen it at one of our summits? Is it all new to everyone? Excellent. Which is just what you want on a really sunny Friday. You want some dude to come in from a software vendor and tell you all about a process. So we'll try and make this relatively interesting. So what we're going to go through is effectively the incident response process that we run at PagerDuty which is, as Tom alluded to, is based upon a number of best practices. So we work with a number of guys across, across Silicon Valley, from the Facebooks and the Ubers, through to the Spotify's up in Sweden, and also looking, as we mentioned, at some of the best practices seen in government. And we'll walk through some of that as well. We may also walk through having an incident as well. So let's make sure my volume's turned up for later on. And let's crack on. So why have we turned up today? So we're going to talk about best practice for incident response. An incident response, as far as we're concerned, is an organized approach to addressing and managing an incident. And the key word there, and I'm going to underline every key word as we go along, is organized. We want to cut through chaos. Um, I was chatting to some guys at The Economist recently. It was actually Sam that gave me a beautiful quote. She was, uh, prior to pager duty, it wasn't necessarily chaos. Everyone tried to respond. They're really passionate. They're really keen to get things up and running. But it was a little bit disorganized, for want of a better word, every now and again. So by applying a proper response process, we managed that kind of organized approach to addressing and managing incidents. So the goal of incident response is to handle a situation that limits the damage, reduces recovery, recovery time and costs of an incident, of a major outage happening across some, I shouldn't say like ITV hub or something like that. We just want to reduce the cost. We don't want to solve the issue. And this is the one of the things as techies, so my background, I'm a coder by trade, but I work for our solution consulting division. I have a habit of wanting to solve problems. Incident response is about getting things up and running, reducing the issues or the potential cost on a business and getting things going again. It's not about solving an issue. That's problem management, that's change management, that's things that happen the next day, not the here and now. So do you guys have, I know you've got a number of different teams, do you have a definition for what an incident actually is across ITV? Massive, We've got... Massive volume of people doing it on Twitter swearing at it. So that, that is it. So when that happens, you know you're in an incident. Is that an in, actually, out of interest, is that an incident or a major incident? Ah, cool. So it's all about the four-letter words, essentially. So we say that an incident, and we have a distinction, we have incidents which are effectively disruptions or degradations affecting our customers being able to use our product. And customers is one of those horrible, very loose terms. So it could be end public, it could be internal customers using email or something along those lines. This for us is any incident. A major incident, so we have a distinction between the two, is an incident that requires coordinated response between multiple teams. And this is really where an incident response process comes into play. Because if you're talking about just one team or one person fixing an issue, then that's normally quite an easy thing to do. Once you start to get the elements of chaos involved, the elements of chaos being human beings and people, that's where we really do need a process to start driving things. So for us at PagerDuty, I always see incidents in two ways, or spotting problems and in incidents in one of two ways. We have telemetry. So do you guys have accurate telemetry across all your systems? Have you got an APM or a monitoring tool and some infrastructure monitoring and all that sort of stuff? Your thresholds tune so much that you can tell when things are good and you can tell when things are bad. Excellent stuff. Any false alerts from telemetry? There's the odd few knots, but you think you've got mostly nailed in this day and age. <laughs> 
But that's what we focus on. So at PagerDuty, when we're using our monitoring systems, we've defined, and over the 10 years we've been going for, we've got very clear thresholds between what is good and what is bad. And when tri things trickle into bad, then they're effectively an incident. And when they get really bad, when they go past the SEV free mark, we're then into major incidents. We use, do you use P1s, SEV ones? What's your distinction around here? What's, what's your gnarly one? Depends on the team. Oh, we, we've got the same thing. So we, at PagerDuty, our standard is SEV is what we refer to. We've got some teams that we use emoticons and all that sort of thing. So you get a big fire for a P1, a poop if it's a SEV2 and various other things going down the wall. I, um, they introduced a head bashing against the wall the other day for a SEV5, which I thought was quite a pleasant thing to see. So what we're gonna talk about today is when things get worse than a SEV3 or a P3, when we're into that SEV2, SEV1 scenario. And another quick question. In ITV today, can anyone trigger a P1 or a P2 incident? Or have you got it restricted? My American friends, we have a scenario that even the janitor, which in our language is a caretaker, can trigger off an incident. If someone is walking past one of the graphs on screen, and yes, we still have dashboards up on screen with graphs on it, if a human being spots a pattern that looks wrong, they're able to trigger off a PagerDuty incident within our uh, main systems. And we, like a lot of the world, I'll be intrigued. Are you guys slackers or are you Microsoft teamers? You're slackers. Good move. Pardon, sorry. Oh, yes. I can see the socks. Excellent stuff. So within PagerDuty, we have our slash command to bring out our incident commanders. So when we need someone to run a major incident, or even if we're concerned that something doesn't look right, then we'll allow anyone across PagerDuty to trigger off and call out our incident commanders. And we'll see what an incident commander does a little bit later on. So hopefully in your Slack instance, do you have a, like a big red button slash command that you can all use and trigger off? There is no big red button. Maybe we should get a big red button in, have a little bit of fun. We actually do advocate, so the, pro the stuff that we're gonna go through, some of the incident commander and the incident response process, we advocate it's better to err on the side of caution. Allow people to feel comfortable with the concept of triggering an alert. Because if the worst thing happens, and it's actually not really a real incident, you've managed to have a bit of practice, you've tested the process, you've seen that it works. And you can also sit back and relax because you haven't been sweating because you genuinely haven't had to be fixing a major incident. So what we now have, when an incident occurs, we go from a situation of peacetime to wartime. I did this presentation a couple of months in Dusseldorf and it made for an interesting terminology conversation here. So I had to kind of change that afterwards with a Brit out in Germany is always highly entertaining. But this is how we refer to it in PagerDuty. And we actually say, when a major incident occurs, we switch to a wartime mode effectively. So if there is an issue on our SaaS platform, and it doesn't happen, but we've been going for nine years. You get the odd few little quirks every now and again. The rules for us change because this is the lifeblood of our business. Our platform is how we make money. If it goes down, it is not a good thing at all. It's fundamentally our revenue stream. So the rules for us are completely different in wartime compared to when they're peacetime. And you'll see some of the rules that we've adopted. You can use peacetime or wartime. As I said, sometimes that's a bit strong. So you can actually vary between normal and emergency, okay and not okay. And to cover some of the other things, I mentioned about the fact that we based our best practice upon some of the government material out there as well. So our initial system we based, based on NIMS. So NIMS is, it's an American framework, National Incident Management System, but it was put together after the California wildfires. So what they observed was that firefighting teams in California were really good at putting out fires. When they had the wildfires back in the 1970s and they tried to get lots of teams together to start putting them out, 
actually found that pretty chaotic. They worked well on their own, but together it was absolute chaos. And that's where the NIM system effectively came into play in the US. And we've adopted a lot of these standards with our incident response because it really does make sense. So what does that actually look like? And this is the structure that we have at PagerGT. And we're gonna talk about this uh, guy or girl shortly, the incident commander or shorten to IC, but we'll refer to why that's not always a good idea to shorten. This is the person that effectively runs and manages an incident. And we'll talk about all their roles and responsibilities as we go through. I'm gonna go through all the rest of the roles here and we'll say for some small organizations and you're not a small organization, it isn't mandatory to have all of these roles on day one, but it makes sense to be aware of some of these roles. So as well as an incident commander, we also advocate having a deputy because every now and again, under pressure, an incident commander, if something really bad has happened and the four letter word has hit the fan, then it is quite a tense moment. You wanna be making sure that your incident commander is making the right decisions and there's someone to back them up just in case. Oh, wait a minute, have you thought about this scenario? We'll also accompany them with a scribe. So at PagerGT, we actually use Slack as well, and we'll use Slack as our de, de facto scribe mechanism. Very importantly, a scribe's role isn't to put, Jack said this, Sarah said that. It's actually to take down notes of actions that have been discussed, which decisions you're going to make, and potentially some of the risks involved in doing that. So at the end of your incident, you can actually accurately collate your post-mortems. And a quick check again, you all do post-mortems and root cause analysis for every incident that comes along across all teams. Of the really big ones. That's, that's all I like. So three and above. That's good to hear. Post-mortems are good. And they're all completely 100% blameless, aren't they? Depends on the team. I like that as well. <laughs> I won't probe any further because that could be slightly awkward. So again, using NIMS, we classify these as the command team effectively. And underneath the command team sits two additional roles. These are the liaisons. These are the people that are gonna manage the communications out to the rest of the world. These are not techies. Let's put it like this. You never want a techie speaking directly to a customer. And as I said earlier, a customer could be someone external to ITV, or it could be one of your internal stakeholders. What we've done internally at PagerDuty is we've got a customer liaison that manages outgoing comms. So we actually have written into our SLAs, for example, with yourselves, if there's an incident or anything happens, then we are mandated to get information out to you within 72 hours. We have core customers, you probably fit into our upper tier, which is quicker than 72 that we need to react to and get information out to quickly. We also in turn have our internal liaisons because the messages you're giving to the execs are gonna be slightly different from the ones you'll be giving to your customers. And again, actually, they are the people you really wanna keep the techies away from. I'm a techie myself, I can insult ourselves because we're just gonna be gobbledygook and crazy language all about Javas and .NETs and restarting things and cloud and all sorts of nonsense like that. The, the stakeholders aren't interested. They want to know other things and we'll talk about that shortly. So these are the liaison teams. And then finally, we get to the important people, the subject matter experts, the guys that can actually fix our issues. So again, back to NIMS, our operations team that get involved. So the incident commander is responsible for the communication between all, that team, all those teams and facilitating effectively solving our major incidents. We're gonna focus on the incident commander today. And we're gonna talk about what roles they should play and definitely the roles they play in pager duty and feel free to 100% cannibalize any ideas that you hear today. So the incident commander is effectively the single source of reference. Everything should go depending upon your organization via the incident commander. There shouldn't be things happening somewhere else that they're not aware of. 
They don't have to know all the details, but there's nothing more annoying than, oh yeah, Dave fixed that in the background. You don't need to worry about that anymore. We need to understand what happened so that we can then go and make sure that doesn't happen again. We talked about wartime and peacetime rules. So in PagerDuty, the incident commander, when we're in a wartime situation with a P1, becomes the highest authority. Where's the clicker? Yes, you may ask, even higher than our CEO. So Jen, our CEO, she is aware, and it's so important that if you run this rule, you make sure you socialize this with your execs before you have an incident. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but before you have an incident, because the last thing you want to do is tell your CEOs, oh, this guy from PagerDuty said that we're now in charge. So make sure you circulate that. And to be frank, even when we uh, told Jen this was gonna be the scenario, she had a few problems trying to accept this, but she's good with it now. She sees the positives of it all. Would that work here? Yeah, to an extent. To an extent, I love the to an extent, yeah. <laughs> I think Jen feels to an extent as well. They can have their fun, but just in case, <laughs> I'm the one who holds the power. And importantly, and this is key, and this is, uh, I actually went out to Just Eat this week and we did, did a very much some conversations around this as well. An incident commander, the person running an incident is not responsible to try and fix the problem. They're the coordinators. They're effectively the conductors of the orchestra. When they start fixing things, they're not doing a particularly good job of actually running the incident. Their mind's elsewhere, it's concentrating on other things, it's looking into log files, looking into graphs, it's not focusing on coordinating and orchestrating the response to an incident. The analogy they have with the wildfires, and it's a very, Ameri have we got any Americans in the room just before I insult the whole of the US? That's always good. Um, I love our American friends, but they're, they're freezing normally for the, uh, their NIM system. Um, and when it comes to fire, if you see a guy with a white hat and a wrench in his hand, take the wrench off him, hit him over the head because he should not be running the incident as well as working on the incident. So the white hats are their incident commanders in the fire service. So let's talk about this scenario. Let's talk about the 3 a.m. It's nice and quiet, it's nice and calm. In fact, do you get many incidents 3 a.m.? I suppose yours are gonna be more the evenings, aren't they? They're gonna be 9 p.m. on a Sunday night. As again, our American friends would say, this went down to Nabby and Zahn and all that sort of stuff. That's, that's gonna be key, isn't it? But let's go for the 3 a.m. scenario. The kids are fast asleep and so is the dog and my six-year-old is about to be mauled by the puppy, so we'll skip on to the next slide. The and something terrible happens. That's bad. Has everyone, has, has everyone got the Page of Duty app? Yay. Have you heard this wonderful ringtone that we have? The Barbershop Quartet. Oh, you've got to have the Barbershop Quartet on. It's so much better than just a regular ping. It's great. Uh-oh. Something happened. Goodness knows what it is. So we're going to have an incident. Let's run through an incident and see what happens. Something broke, happy debugging. What's the first thing you do in an incident? What's the very first thing you should think of? Ah, oh, the first thing, don't panic. <laughs> Sit back, relax to a certain degree. Panic's never a good thing. So let's, uh, let's figure out what's going on. And, and I'm actually going to ask here, who here actually has an incident commander style role. I'll say style role, because I appreciate it may vary. Ooh. Yeah, we have duty, managers. duty managers. Who's a duty manager? I'm, I'm both, but not at the same time. <laughs> Excellent, that's good to hear. Who, fa who fancies becoming a duty manager or an incident commander? Oh, volunteer. Oh, we've got a few nodding heads. That's good. Don't panic. So, when an incident happens, we jump on a bridge call. I'm going to ask, bridge calls, slack rooms, do you ever do bridge? Pardon? Depends on the team. Depends on the team. Preference for slack. Preference for slack. We don't like talking to anyone in this day and age. 
but yeah, and actually, to be frank, I find that uh, when I used to have a lot of incidents, I used to work for a telecommunications company that's fairly well known, and I used to have a lot of incidents, and actually bridge calls were the worst way of teasing out information from people because I always knew there was a guy called Manoj on those bridge calls who always knew what the problem was, but he'd never speak up until he was 100% sure what was going on. Lots of other people make tons of other noise, but they were bloody useless compared to Manoj. But anyway, complete tangent. So we jump onto our bridge call. An incident's happened. We've mobilized everyone using some sort of software by a wonderful company that I may work for. So everyone's already there on your Slack room. Oh, and we have a new Slack integration coming out shortly, mid-month, next month, worth checking out. So we're, on the, we're now on the PagerDuty created incident channel. Excellent new feature. Or we're on a bridge call. First step, introduce yourself. So hi, my name is Tim. Second step, and very importantly, is introduce your role. Say, I am the incident commander. So a major issue is occurring. And one of the key things that you've done is you've reinforced the fact that A, there is an incident now happening, and B, I am in charge. We always say that good communication is absolutely essential. So when I say incident commander, I say very clearly, use the term incident commander, don't use this nonsense. Let's get the IC on the RC, then get a BLT for all the SMEs. So always use the phrase incident commander, especially when you're introducing yourself, to reinforce the authority that you're going to have as this incident plays out. The other thing is all those horrible acronyms that we're probably guilty. Do you guys feel, again, ITV, you are an acronym in itself. Too many acronyms, not enough acronyms. Just about right. Lots of acronyms. Absolutely. Our rule in PagerDuty is no acronyms on incident calls. And a couple of reasons for that. We would rather you spend 20 seconds saying an, a sentence that everyone understands than trying to whack it out in five seconds and hope that everyone's up with you. And especially seeing as you've got different levels of experience. We might have Alex, our CTO, on board, who's been, of course, there 10 years since he founded the company, who knows every acronym in PagerDuty going, versus we're, we're a fast-growth company. Uh, we've, I'll go into it. Uh, the, I was employee number four in the UK 18 months ago, and we're now at 32. So we're adding a lot of employees regularly. They won't know what the acronyms are. And I don't know about you guys, but I always feel a bit stupid when I do have to put up my hand and say, what does that stand for? And everyone turns around and goes, duh, didn't you know? But um, so no acronyms. That's one of our key rules. Clear is better than concise. So we've introduced ourselves. We've got our rules, no acronyms. Our next stage is to size up the problem. So what's wrong? Why are we suddenly on this bridge call? Can you give us an idea very quickly and clearly what's the problem that's going on? First step. Next step, what actions can we take? What things can we actually do to remedy the situation? So I'll go for a couple of cloud examples. Let's, let's take cloud. Cloud's a great one. So I could say, what actions could we do? And there could be two answers. One could be, oh, we could auto scale or we could spin up some more EC2 instances. It's now horrible with Lambda functions as an example, but let's say we're gonna spin up some more tin. And the risk involved with that is pretty minimal. Because if you're just going to scale out your environment, you're not going to be taking things down necessarily. So hopefully you could get away without making a bad situation any worse. Conversely, there could be other options that you could take. Like I always use rolling back a deployment. And if you're in Java land, then sometimes that involves restarting things and taking things down and actually making your customer experience briefly worse to then go and fix a situation. So we want to know what's wrong, what actions can we take, and then what are the risks involved. The next stage is a really key one, making a decision. Is it easy to make decisions in ITV when there's an incident going on? Depends on the team. Depends on the team. Oh, I hate that answer. <laughs> it's a good, quick, fast answer, isn't it? But absolutely, really does depend on the team. 
There's a couple of tricks to this as well. I'm going to show you the, the key trick that we use at PagerDuty. You've got this challenge. So we'd like to say life is a democracy. When we're in an incident, it's not. The incident commander is the dictator. They're effectively the guy that's running the show, but they're not the person making decisions because we can't pin that on them. What we need to do when there's an issue running, we need to gain rapidly consensus. So what I'm gonna do, let's, uh, let's try and gain consensus. So we'll start with this slide. This background is blue, my statement. Is this true, is this blue? You're gonna go with yes. Tom, what do you think, is this blue? I agree, depends on the team. Depends on the team, <laughs> perfect answer. Let's carry on going, is this background blue? Oh, I love it. Shall I carry on going? Is that going to be a little bit on the tedious side? It is, isn't it? So one way guarantee, so excuse my French, but this is one way guaranteed to piss off your partner, friends, work colleagues when they start hearing this phrase come up regularly. You ask, statement, are there any strong objections? So we're going to roll back that last deployment. Everyone on the team, any strong objections? Hearing none, let's proceed. So to reiterate, the one word that's really important here is strong objections. My wife now detests it when I use this phrase because she knows it's come straight from work and I get the obvious lecture of stop, stop that crap, I know what you're doing there. But we talk about strong objections. And what this does, this negates the I told you so syndrome that we all know because what we want to do is we want to act quickly, implement one of our actions, and sometimes an action can re lead to an outcome that might be, in inverted commas, worse than the situation you're within, which is a bad scenario, I admit, but one of the really good outcomes from taking a wrong action is you generate new information. You've got new information that can help the decision-making process. 10 times better to do something and it may go wrong than sit there with analysis paralysis, do nothing, and hope the thing magically solves itself eventually. So gain consensus quickly and use this, any strong objections, in order to rapidly make a decision. Makes sense. Is that all good? Actually, I asked just at the start of this... Um, could anyone keep an eye on the time? Does anyone know how long I've been running for? Anyone? Approximately. Uh, I said at the start, I, I, I did that can someone. One of the other challenges, as well as making a decision, is the can someone syndrome. Has anyone felt this before, experienced this before? When you're on a call, and good old fashioned, if I go to old fashioned crappy bridge calls that I used to have to endure at the telecommunications company, where you get 200 people onto a bridge call, you've got one of the managers going there, can someone go off and have a look at that? The problem with the can someone is it assumes that someone's going to pick it up. So if I go back to Sam's scenario, she mentioned, uh, as I said, that uh, people in their organisations, would they would all go and jump on something to try and fix it because they're all keen. Or actually, that other organisation I worked for, nobody would go and do it because they'd all be in a little bit in fear that they'd get blamed if something went wrong with it. So very important to avoid the can someone syndrome. And how do we do that? Well, we do that by explicitly calling out the person that we want to do it. So in this case, Eric, I'd like you to investigate the increased latency. Try to find the cause and I'll come back to you in five minutes. Understood? And the reaction from Eric, who happens to be the page duty dog, is understood. A couple of things that we've done in this one that's really important. In fact, there's about three or four very important things just in those sentences alone. The first one is we've actually assigned the task to a specific person, individual, or I'm sure you all know everyone and you all know each other's names. Uh, and this actually came up at the, uh, the take, well, I shouldn't call it takeaway, the technology company that may help with takeaways earlier on this week. They were like, do you know what? 
I've been working with that, that bloke for at least a year and I still can't remember what his name is. I just can't get it into my head. The other option you can do is you could say the database guy on call or the developer on call, but you must make sure you explicitly assign the task to a person to avoid the can someone syndrome. The next step in that sentence, time box your task. And this isn't Star Trek Enterprise style, you've got 10 minutes to fix this. This is actually giving someone, do you know what, you've got five minutes, can you take a look and come back to me in five minutes? I don't want you to resolve, I just want you to come back to me with an update on how far you've got in five minutes. Very importantly, after that, so we've, we've done that, we've spat out all our, our requests, get acknowledgement back, actually get Eric the pager duty dog to go, yep, I understand what you're asking me to do, understood, I'll come back, even if it means him actually reiterating the situation. So continuing on with our incident, and if only everything was like this, so I go back to Eric, it's been five minutes now, have you got any more information on our latency problem? And yeah, it's that pesky old firewall. It's always the firewall. It used to be the network. Now it's firewalls that are causing us problems in cloud land. It was a bad firewall rule. That's great. We can all go back to sleep again. Sometimes incidents don't run quite that easily. So what if they need more time? The best approach, again, avoid the Star Trek Enterprise syndrome. How much time do you actually need then to work on this? So you've given someone, allotted them an amount of time to come back to you. And to reiterate, if they, if they jump on it and they find out what the issue was in one minute, that's great. There should be a mechanism or a channel in order for them to communicate back that after one minute they found the issue, it can be resolved. That's why Slack and an open bridge call is pretty good for that. But if they need more time, our second step, and this is all the way we run it at PagerDuty, we then ask, well, how much time do you need, do you think, to actually investigate this? 20 minutes should be enough. I'll come back to you in 20 minutes. And this is how we run all our calls. So to reiterate what we do, when we have an issue, and obviously I always touch wood, they don't happen very often at all, it's beautiful. We practice a lot though, um, so we ask for status. What's wrong? What's the problem? We side, effectively size up the situation. We decide the actions that we can take and then gain consensus from our teams. We assign a task, make sure that someone assigns the task and actually understands the task and that which they've got to undertake. And then last but not least, we follow up after a specified time period, and we carry on. So as I said before, if you make an action, you do something, that's gonna have an effect. It, well, one of three things are gonna happen. It's either gonna get worse, it's gonna stay as is, or it's gonna get better. But that information can then feed the next decision process, and we carry on, and we carry on, and we carry on. The scribe makes sure that all of that information is captured. Not Bob said, Sarah said, just the details around that. And then we'll get to a stage where we resolve that incident. We actually ended up with two slides randomly for this. So this is one of them. We've simplified it more into this as well. So size up the problem through to stabilizing the system. And that can be an iterative process in itself. Through to feeding back our updates and then verifying hopefully that the situation's all solved. So we'll do. That's our incident hopefully resolved. There's a couple of areas that I want to go over as well that really catch us out as incident commanders or actually anyone involved in running an incident. So first couple of areas that I've got to make sure they cover. If you jump onto a bridge call or there's an issue that's happening. So one of the scenarios I was hit with uh, earlier on this week actually was if you've got a scenario that's playing out in a slack room and it's not deemed to be a major incident yet. In that slack room, there needs, should be a way that you can actually call out an incident commander and bring your incident commanders on board to come and assist. And I will say about this, because you may have that slack room, but again, techies 
Techies are great, but we're not always brilliant at running incidents. You want someone that can stand above that, outside of the details, and coordinate a response. So if on that call there is no IC, and you happen to be the first one coming on board who is a qualified IC, and this is again how we run it at PagerDuty, when we join a call, we always check. Any other ICs on the call? Hearing none, and then go through your intro. Again, full name or short name, however you want to be referred to on the call. And importantly, I'm the incident commander. Now the bit that I always love to present is this, executive swoop. Do you guys suffer from this at all? I'm sure your execs just are completely hands off, let you run it, they never bother you at all. If, there's, if the hub goes down, for example, I assume nobody wants an update at all. Excellent. He is good. Excellent, that's what I want to hear. Well, so he's quite good at handing. They're sometimes some of the worst. So the founders of, so the techies of the company I was with this week, they are the worst at getting on bridge calls. And another beautiful story I heard, to the point that they would sometimes ask questions. And because it was the founders and the bosses that asked the questions, it would quite often derail the incident, they'd say, have you checked down in the logs in Encapsula? And they'd all go off running off because Rich and Dave said, go and do this. And sometimes they'd have a habit of actually overriding the incident commander to a certain degree because they were the bosses. So we refer to executive swoop. And for one of better description, executive swoop and poop. So there's a, it's good to hear that you've got yours under control. What we hear with a lot of organizations, it's not always the case. And there's a few things that execs have a habit of doing. The first one is that one. Of course, they're in management. They've been trained in management. They've got MBAs. They know how to lead people. They know how to mobilize. So obviously what you want in terms of a major incident is someone else to suddenly join on the incident with relatively little context of what's going on, but actually enforce their rules. Do you know the best way to get an exec to calm down in this situation? Best way. It works a treat. I've used this before as well. Do you wish to take command? <laughs> so it's great that you're coming on the call. Does that mean that you are now going to stay on the call, adopt the command of this all the way through to the end completion of it? Normally the execs just, they just want to appear, make their mark and disappear off again. Best way to kind of, we don't want to say put them in their box, but kind of control them and manage them in a slightly, it was mentioned earlier on this week, is a slightly passive aggressive to a certain degree. Um, is use this phrase. It kind of reiterates. And what we've done as well, so with that particular company, we've made sure that they've shared all of these slides with their execs so they can be aware of how they shouldn't really behave, how us, dare I say it, how us minions sometimes feel when I'm running a, an incident or working on an incident. I mentioned the, the Star Trek scenario, of course, so let's try and resolve this in 10 minutes, please, because obviously that phrase implies that people dealing with incidents aren't working as hard as they can already. It's actually quite an insulting thing to say to people. So the best way, the get them in their box phrase for this one, nice and calmly, slightly passive aggressively, admittedly, but we're in the middle of an incident. Please keep comments until the end. Because to be frank, that saying that is kind of a bit of an irrelevant bit of noise when we're trying to actually talk about what actions to take the risks involved and those sorts of things this is just ancillary pointless noise is a classic one i don't know if you guys get this one at all but actually i suppose some of the internal systems as well for managing some of the sales guys on ads you may get these sorts of things a spreadsheet of all affected customers because obviously if you're running relatively lean teams that are trying to fix something, you don't want them then going off to databases to do queries that are gonna have absolutely no impact or input on actually fixing the issue in situ. So for this one, the approach that we use, PagerDuty, and to be frank again, because our execs now know what these little tricks are, they never ask those questions. But the way to get rid of that is to actually say, we can either get you that list or we can fix the incident, not both. The incident takes priority. Most important thing that is missing from that is the question mark. 
there's no what would you like question. We're actually statement of truth. Because if I go back to one of my statements earlier, we have wartime rules. The rules are different when we're under a SEV2, SEV1 incident than if they would be day-to-day -day running of our business. I like all these little rules because this is another cracker that I've had to endure in 20 years of IT. People getting on a call and going, is this really a SEV1? It smells more like a two. I, I'd, I'd rather we downgraded it to a two. What about our SLAs? We don't want this to be a SEV1 because that means we have to get back to people in four hours. Can't we just knock it to a two? Then I've got twice as much time. Our rules at PagerDuty is we treat everything with the worst scenario that it could be. So the worst thing that could happen is again, you get some really good training, if not. And then the other thing is if it is a SEV1, it turns out to be SEV2. It's great, it's fantastic. So it was less impacting than we thought it was. But we advocate, treat these things pessimistically, that it's a bad one. And again, the uh, put them in their box phrase for this one, again, very clearly, somewhat passive aggressively, we do not discuss incident severity during the call. We're gonna treat this as a SEV1. And to reiterate, there's nothing wrong with practicing your incident response process. If it turns out to be just a, a little annoyance and a little SEV4, then that's great. You've managed to make sure that your processes work. We also advocate, of course, keeping stakeholders appraised of the situation. To be frank, that is why an exec would join a call, because they'll feel like they're just not getting enough information from you. Have you got a, when you have an issue, do you have a, a frequency that you push out updates to your execs? Is there a, so, so they join and watch. Oh goodness me, they're lurkers in the background. Perfect. As I say, we've been in IT for many years and those sorts of things. 20 years ago, I think execs were a pain. Most people get it in this day and age, which is good. So we advocate in pager duty. We, we actually try and keep some of our execs off the really detailed Slack channels. We actually have two, which is our, inter, our as we mentioned before, we have the state, the scribe ones. We have our internal liaison ones as well, which are two separate Slack channels. But we, even if there is no update, every 30 minutes is kind of the minimum that we want to update stakeholders. Using pager duty, there is a nice little status update there in there as well. If you want to push out information to stakeholders. The other little bit of fun we have is we had to change this due to the lawyers. We used to call it the drunk responder, but let's stick with the belligerent responder. So this is again, I, I mentioned earlier, I, I love Sam's analogies. When she said that uh, the people working in her organization were in keen, passionate, enthusiastic. Sometimes incidents happen half 10 at night and you are one of the subject matter experts on your particular component. Unfortunately, you also happen to be down the pub, you've had quite a few drinks, and you pick up that pager duty call and join the bridge call. We have had scenarios where even though the SME might know a lot of details, there are two shoots the wind and they really should just get back to what they were doing. So there's nothing wrong with getting rid of the belligerent slash drunk responder. And that can be either that they're not really contributing to the call or the other option is literally the background noise as anyone. And again, I'm actually probably as guilty of this as anyone else. You're like, oh, I must get on the call. I must help out people. But you're, I don't know, you're going off on your family holiday and you've got screaming kids that you've now seen on my video earlier, screaming kids in the back of the car. My other half say, it's that bloody work again. Leave them alone. And you're desperately trying to answer what should be going on. It's better that sometimes you're just not on the call. Don't get involved. So easy one to get rid of them. You're being disruptive. Please stop. <laughs> one warning. That's what we advocate in Pager Duty. Just the one. We're not going to kick them off straight away, but we'll give them a warning or we'll have to remove you off of the call. Do responders get tired? We're not robots. We're human beings at the end of the day. So I can ask, I like, have you had a really long, nasty, gnarly running incident here? I know it's an awkward question to ask, but one that's gone on for a few hours, or what was the longest in the last year across any of the teams? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yep. During the day. So six hours. to go home that's totally understandable the the observation that we have is actually it's an hour an hour is when you're productive for post that hour you then start to get relative it's when bad decisions effectively start to set in um, and yeah I was gonna say previous companies it was three companies ago we'd have scenarios where people are desperately trying to stay on bridge calls for like 12 hours 14 hours at a time uh, because they genuinely think that's useful so we advocate um, at pager duty our incident commanders if an incident starts running we actually have hourly handovers so we've introduced that in the last six months we used to have two hours but that was actually too long there was a distinct gap or uh, in those kind of hours we encourage handovers so that's why our process has an incident commander and then the deputy that effectively steps in afterwards so the deputy is not the guy on the hook to actually run it but they're listening in they're being aware of what's going on so they can step into the IC shoes they can step out have a break and another deputy comes on in and that we'd we'd actually get a fresh so we've got about 20 incident commanders now across pager duty and we do it we actually do it gra uh, geographically now so i'm you can indeed i'm also an incident commander obviously for pager duty because i'm sat here here so we're, we're to give you the intros we're based out of san francisco so i will say more of our incident commanders are based in san francisco but we've now got san francisco toronto me and matt here in the uk and we've got one of our CSMs in Australia as well. So we can cover kind of global support as and when and if stuff happens. I've only had to be a deputy once and for about half an hour. So I'm quite disappointed I haven't had a real chance. But conversely, I'm very happy I haven't had to have a real chance, which is really good. Um, handovers are encouraged. And this even includes with subject matter experts and some of the other roles that we've got in there as well. So we do again, even going through our incident and the scenarios you should use. Everyone on the call, I'm heading off. I'm handing over command to Eric. And again, to reiterate, then have, this is Eric. I'm now the incident commander. And again, full use of that sentence and that phrase. We advocate have many incident commanders. We have 20. And interestingly enough, we started off by having a lot of our techie guys as incident commanders. And I've mentioned earlier about the scenario that techies can't help fixing stuff. You can't help suddenly getting a little bit hands-on. So for example, Alex, our CTO, is the worst incident commander. We had him briefly as an incident commander and then found out he is just atrocious. He's one of our SMEs and he's more than happy now to be one of the SMEs that comes on the call. The best ones in our organization that we found for incident commanders are, so I run our solution consulting team here in EMEA, is the solution consultants. I'm techie, but I'm not completely conversant with our deep systems and where to get all the logs, but I know enough. So we've actually found uh, well, sales engineers slash solution consultants, our services guys, our project managers have been really good at it. Our product managers have actually been really good as incident commanders as well. So it doesn't always need to be, and sometimes it's not always a good thing to have a techie actually running some of these particular calls. And last couple of things now, we'll, we'll just cover some lovely anti-patterns that I'm sure none of you have ever seen before in your careers. The worst possible one that I always used to see was that one, foul syndrome. Everyone thinks the best way to solve a major incident is get everyone, everyone across the entire organization onto a phone call because that would be the best way to fix a gnarly scenario. The other thing that's really nice is when people spend longer actually writing a ruddy status update than they actually spend fixing or dealing with an incident. And one of the reasons we incorporated a liaison into our process is so that they can keep this sort of information flowing out without interrupting the flow of running the incident. The next one is actually one of my favorites because I am so guilty of this one. 
I, I, I don't do silence, it really kills me. Um, and I just hate bridge calls with silence, so I'm still trying to get to grips with this one. But assuming silence means no progress is not a good thing. We talked earlier when Eric went off to go and have a look at the network issue, we just leave the bridge call open. So even though there is audio there and you can't hear anything, don't feel compelled to keep talking, to keep filling that up with noise. Just let everyone get on with their work. Same in the Slack channel, just annoying every five minutes. Any progress, any progress. If there is, someone will tell you. This is just as much of a gnarly one as getting everyone on the call. It's then forcing people to stay on a call. You want to allow people to drop off when they're no longer needed. And another phrase that we've seen works really well at PagerGT is this one here. So specify the people that you need to stay on the call. Operation support and Eric, please stay. Everyone else, feel free to drop off at your discretion. So actually, in this case, you're not kicking people off the call. You're saying if you want to keep up data, keep abreast, and maybe even input as well, then you can, but I'm not advocating that you need to stay. Again, nice and polite. We're not trying to boot people out. Again, one of the other anti-patterns we have, and this is where a good incident commander comes into play, and this is where the techies are worse, is because when a big issue happens, you end up just completely focused on one area. Incident commanders and good incident commanders have a broad understanding of an ecosystem and how things fit together, so they can actually orchestrate quite well. The other one, taking on multiple roles. Sometimes you might not have a choice, you might have to do this, but by breaking out those individual roles, as we said, scribes, liaisons, SMEs, then you make sure people focus on the task that they need to, rather than trying to do bits of everyone else's job. The last few that we have, litigating policy during an incident and looking at the process. Is this really the best way we should run this process? Maybe we should change it slightly. Maybe we should change the way we do our priorities. Focus on the incident at hand and fixing that. You'll hear a reiteration much of this focus on the incident. I think I've said it quite a few times now. After your incident, don't worry about changing a process. And again, this is one of the most important things. Always learn from the process. We talk about learn from the incident, get to the root cause of it, fix the underlying problems and get things in place. So whether it's a code update or whether it's some sort of funky cloud thing we can do to fix it, but also look at the process. So we are always evolving our incident commander. If you actually look at our online stuff, which I'll talk about in a minute, you'll see that that is frequently updated as we find better practices to do things. So I'm nearly done. The issue is all resolved. It's all nice and clear. And obviously, as we mentioned earlier, you're not neglecting our post-mortems, our root cause analysis. You're going to create the post-mortem, whether you do it in pager duty or a conference page or a Google Doc or something along those lines. Always create a post-mortem report. Pick someone to be responsible response racy yet responsible for doing this they don't have to necessarily be the one that's inputting it but they're the guys responsible for ensuring that it's complete feeding it back out to others making sure that it's completely blameless remember we're not saying jack said sarah said any of those sorts of things this is nice and friendly because in this day and age crap happens and especially as we're all trying to do things quickly I always say my favourite phrase, the only person that doesn't make a mistake is the guy that doesn't do anything. So let's just always move forward. As I say, review the process and practice that process as well. So at PagerDuty we have a beautiful uh, little uh, thing that you can buy. It's only, I think it's about $10 or so. Keep talking and nobody explodes. So the whole idea, this is really good practice for an incident commander. So you've got a guy on a laptop with a bomb and all you've got in front of you is the instructions and you have to guide them through the process of defusing a bomb. In an hour longer incident commander training, we actually go through this, which is always quirky when you ask lots of people to go to bombmanual.com to go and get the things. I have so many people say, is this gonna stay in my internet history? This looks slightly dodgy. So to wrap up, 
we publish all of this on our um, open sourced incident commander training. So incident response.pagerduty.com. There is a screenshot of it up there. So that's all accessible today. So if you want to adopt some of the best practices that you've heard today, um, the guys at Ocado, they, they actually may be speaking alongside you at Summit as well. They literally have just forked this and made it their own process that they've published internally. And then that's about it. So thanks to everyone for attending. Those are the key takeaways from the presentation that I've given. I hope that was useful. We've got a, uh, I know Tom's actually presenting it as well, but everyone's welcome to come and join us June the 12th for our Connect event, which is somewhere just around the corner. And that's it. Any questions, comments, queries? Any questions? The, it will never fly here. That sort of stuff's crazy. Or we're doing that already today. That's awesome. All you've done is reinforce what we thought was excellent practice. Or feel free to disagree. Mr. Smith. <coughs> uh, a silly admin question. Do you have any um, best practices for storing postmortems? Uh, I've just been getting dirty looks because I forgot to write it the last one. Um, <laughs> but um, where do you store them for central usage and, and looking them up and stuff like that? So, Daryl Rissé, we do have postmortems in. Do you have access to our postmortems in Pager no. Duty? No. You don't. No. So, we do actually have a facility there. Typically, I hear a lot of people use Confluence as their general postmortem best practice. Um, I had other guys the other day that were using Google Docs, and a well organized Google Drive was quite a nice way of them doing it. And the way they use it is they kind of they use our postmortems. They export as PDF, cut and paste it out because what you get in there is the pager duty timeline. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also incorporate your Slack feeds into there as well. So it's, but yeah, one of those three is the one that I typically see. Anyone else? What? That's great. No, Tim, thank you very much for coming in. That's yeah, great. No problems at all. There's more donuts. There's, there's, donuts left? I think there's plenty of donuts left, actually. There's 48 of them. Yeah, so I think, like we were saying, I mean, we have a kind of a, a, a mixed bag, I guess, of approaches. We've kind of got a lot of stuff in our kind of more agile, cloud first kind of based apps where they generally work really well. And so, actually, a lot of our instant process isn't as, as kind of highly polished as that. I think online is a bit of an exception because it's, it's so kind of public facing. And then we've got a, a different one where actually the instant process is quite good because things break a little bit more often so we have an interesting kind of like two speed approach but I think there's loads of stuff here we'd like to kind of take away and actually take into our process because it does seem to be all kind of wheels being reinvented in, in different teams and I think actually something like this is a like a North Star to align to would be great. So. We have as well we can share I have a pre-recorded version of this as well as some of the documentation so we can share that afterwards great. as well. Very good. Okay, one more round of applause for Tim please thank you. Thank you.